Gentle lady, her time is precisely on. So thank you so much. Uh, Chair now recognizes himself. Um, and I think I have a video as well. Is that video ready? My constituent. My name is Chin Fen Yan. My husband and I live in Huntington, Virginia. We filed our 2019 paper return along with our full payment in 2020. In July 2021, we received a letter from the IRS incorrectly claiming we had underpaid 2019 tax. We tried to call IRS at least 10 times. Once was put on hold and then disconnected. Second time, the person couldn't help us at all. After all this, we sent a certified letter to IRS in August 2021. We have since been getting frequent IRS notices threatening us with penalties and fines. This has been a frustrating and intimidating experience. And this matter is still not completely resolved as of April 2022. I thank my constituent uh, for her testimony and I, I will avail myself, Mr. Reddick, of your offer to help on individual cases and we really appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Collins, uh, you've been lonely and I, I wanna make up for that. I was uh, gonna say, I think I'm the only one that asked her any questions. That exactly, so I'm gonna, try to, I'm gonna try to make up for that. Uh, Ms. Collins, in your blog post, you recommended that the IRS, quote, work with the tax software industry to implement 2D barcoding. Could you expand on that? Why would that help? Why should we do that? And why haven't we done it? Yeah, in, in my opinion, and again, I'm not an IT expert, so um, I personally don't have a, a, a particular interest, whether they do 2D barcoding versus OCR versus whatever technology there is. But what we really want is to have the process automated so that we don't need human, we don't need the employees to actually enter the information. My understanding of 2D barcoding, uh, the big advantage to it is it is very accurate. Um, and so that would reduce any challenges or problems entering the data in. OCR, but the challenge with 2D barcoding, it's only for those returns prepared using um, software that uh, either a private or the IRS would provide. So it's about 50, 60% of those paper returns. And let, me, our estimate. and let me just ask the commissioner, commissioner, where are we on this? I mean, do you support that? Do you agree that it would reduce human error? Uh, which I, I sometimes do. And we, we requested funding in our, our uh, congressional budget justification in 2013, 14, 15, 16, and 17, and we were never funded for 2D barcoding or scanning. So the IRS as an agency pivoted into the electronic filing, which certainly as I think people are aware, at least currently is running at the rate of about 96%. And the president's fiscal 23 budget also provides for funding to get us into this space. And yeah, I come back again to what I mentioned earlier and I'm trying to race through this, but uh, with the current budget, you know, although the agency got significant funding, when you for fiscal 22, when you look at how it plays out and the cost of living adjustments, our operations support is down $100 million. That's real money. And so why a lane may be X dollars to create, we also have to have funding to keep that operational going forward. Let me, let me just do it in a CR. Let me just say, I couldn't agree with you more. And while some people may talk about throwing money at the IRS, and that's not the solution, uh, for a decade, uh, Congress did the opposite. We took away money. Uh, and as I showed in that opening chart, the gap grew and grew. And uh, the IRS was not able to perform, in some cases, some basic functions because of the antiquated IT and because your staffing continued to go down as the population went up as demands for uh, and inquiries to IRS for information went up. Uh, and of course, actually, so did the roles we in Congress assigned to the IRS. So at some point, disinvestment means doing less with less. Um, and we need to turn that around. Um, and we, need, we in Congress needed to take responsibility. Mr. Reddick, uh, one thing you've talked about, and my time's gonna run out, so I just wish you'd address this. We, we used to use the figure of $450 billion left on the table, owed in taxes, but not collected every year. And I remember distinctly a year or two ago, you saying that number actually is closer to a trillion. Could you elaborate? Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna issue our tax gap estimate this summer for the next three years. It goes in three year cycles. The last cycle that we released was 2011 to 13. The next one is 
2012, 13, and 14, but you're going to see us do a projection for 2019. What is not in those estimates is virtual currencies, and, and there's over a $2 trillion market cap for virtual currencies. Last year, there was over $14 trillion in transactions in virtual currencies. And the United States, if you, if you do relative GDP, the United States is somewhere between 35 and 43% of that $14 trillion. We know from our John Doe summons activity in this space with respect to these are public actions, Coinbase and others, that the compliance issues in the virtual currency space are significantly low. And I, I'm uh, enhancing the word significantly. What also is not in our tax gap estimates is foreign source income. The tax gap estimates that the IRS prepares are based on information that the IRS is able to determine, not information that we know is out there, but we're not able to determine. You've seen in 2019, we added a virtual currency question to the Form 1040 on Schedule L. We moved it up to, to page one last year to try to enhance compliance. And obviously we're um, looking to get into that area significantly. Thank you, Mr. Rennick. And I know we're gonna wanna talk to you a lot about that because if I can paraphrase the late Senator Everett Dirksen, a trillion here, a trillion there, pretty soon we're talking about real money. And our employees, want this. We, we want to earn the trust and respect. To Ranking Member Heiss's comment, the employees here are here for the right reasons. And, you know, we live and work in these communities where you have people who are, you know, making these comments and we're very sens sensitive and sympathetic. We want to get this right. People are here for the right reasons. And we would like to interact with all of you and try to address your concerns, comments, and where we need to change, we will change. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I think uh, as we're closing the hearing, I have a picture from 1977, uh, the IRS Computer Center in uh, Martinsburg, West Virginia. And what's sad about that picture is here we are in 2021, and that picture could be replicated today in many places. Uh, we've got to upgrade our IT. Um, I'd like to uh, ask unanimous consent to assert in the record at this time, the GA report to the congressional committees called Tax Filing April 2022 on 2021 performance. Without objection, is so ordered. Mr. Heiss, if you get anything you want added for the record? No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, if, if there are additional items uh, or if there are additional questions for our two witnesses, I would ask members, send them through the chair and would ask our witnesses to try to, uh, through the next five days, and I'd ask our witnesses to try to get back to us with answers as expeditiously as possible. I wanna thank Commissioner Reddick for his openness and his availability to us. Uh, and I think you've, uh, you've gone a long way in helping to illuminate where we are in this tax season. I wanna thank Erin uh, Collins for her advocacy on behalf of all of us as taxpayers uh, and, uh, and uh, keep on doing it uh, because as all of us kind of have stories today, Republicans and Democrats, we've got constituents who still have trouble in terms of getting access. And, and that creates enormous stress when you owe taxes or think you might owe taxes or when you deserve a refund or just want to know the status of something. Uh, so we, we need to improve, we need to make investments uh, and we will continue to provide oversight as Mr. Heiss has requested of the IRS. Uh, with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you everybody.